In talking to players that played with Mahmoud and played against him, to steal a phrase from the NBA vernacular, he was uncheckable, according to those players. He could get his shot against anybody. And despite that most coveted NBA skill, Mahmoud believes he was eventually forced out of the league. Could anybody cover you? No. I, I, I say it this way. I don't believe me, man. I'm doing this for you, <laughs> but because I don't like talking like that. In the NBA, you you can you can't stop nobody. You can try to contain them. I say it in that context. You know, uh, in that context, no. I mean, I feel confident about my ability to score, my ability to create separation, to get my shot off. I'll never forget one of the greatest performances I've ever seen in the NBA was the night you had in Salt Lake City at the Delta Center. What do you remember about that 51 point night? Man, I, I, the, the game before I had a concussion, I think in Boston. And uh, I was, man, just super relaxed. I, I mean, I was, I mean, I was just in a zone. The ball was like a yo-yo. Everything just felt perfect. And my first shot, I, I believe, you know, I think it was a baseline shot. Boom, I crossed back over, and it, now actually it, boom, went in. And I think my second shot. Then after a few, I'm like, man, you know, you don't want to say too much. You don't want to disturb the moment. I'm saying to myself, man, it's in my head. Just stay relaxed, stay humble. I, I used to always pray to myself, you know, in the name of Allah, in the name of God, you know, keep me grounded without losing it. I'm always talking to myself in my head. Because I was like, man, tonight is... I, I felt it was special. You know, what was always amazing to me, I think except for one year in Denver, I think, I think, I don't know my stats as much, but I was told that four years I led the team in scoring and maybe assist for a period in a row. One of those years, I think that whole year, I pretty much started with no problems. The other three of those years, they always found a way to use me as a scapegoat when they shaking up the lineup. And I remember one day how sad it is for me to mention this because it just, it, I was angry, I was emotional, you know, I was tired. And Daniels who came to me again, said, look, we're trying to shake up the lineup. We're gonna sit you. And man, I couldn't hold it back, you know, tears coming up. I said, man, why is it always me? Why do you use me to shake up the lineup? I've never heard in my life, I'm not comparing myself to Jordan, Isaac, none of them. I've never heard in the history of basketball, your leading scorer and assist maker, he's the one you're gonna sit to shake up a lineup. Like these guys really care. Oh man, they sat my mood, let's go out and play now and win. Man, people trying to get contracts and you know what I mean, get minutes. You think that that's gonna make a difference? And see, to me that, it was always like, man, why am I always the guy? You know, it's like when I became Muslim, you know, the fasting was an issue, the praying was an issue. You know, I was told not too long ago, man, Dan was always concerned, man, people would be coming up to his room and he'd be spending all nights talking. I don't know what he's talking about. I'm not killing nobody. I'm not, I'm not coming back to practice drunk. I'm not doing anything crazy. Why should that be a concern? That told me that, see, it was beyond basketball. You know, in some, in some people's minds of what was happening to me. Do you believe now, looking back, did you reach your full potential as a player? No, I think, uh, I think a lot of, you know, uh, people used to ask me, man, do you think you were blackballed? <laughs> I was going to ask you that. And, you and, led, led and, to it. Huh? And, and, and I, I would say, you know what? I don't know. But all I'll say is, I think a lot of my best years were taken away. When I really began to mature, not having to use as much energy to get it done, smarter about the game, even now. But... Uh, uh, I, and I say that because there was a period when I was 
still young. I was just trying to get trials. No one would open their doors to even see me trial. And there was one particular guy, I'm not going to mention his name, he'll be in the book. He's still with the NBA, a high position. Told my agent, uh, when inquiring about me, said, well, we're not interested. And it has nothing to do with his basketball either. <laughs> and, you know, I said, man, boy, I said, I wish I would have known that then. And I wish we could we could have captured that. Because I would have made a person like that pay if I could have. Uh, I was in California, a summer league, doing well. So well that uh, Elgin Baylor and his, and, his, and his crew called me. I said, look, Elgin want to meet you. I want to talk to you tomorrow. It's okay, no problem. And I came to the gym. That was my off day. Came to the gym. I'm sitting in the stands. I can see Elgin and his people over there looking, looking back. The guy ended up coming over to me. He said, my mood, he said, I apologize, man. I said, what's going on? He said, Elgin, not only, he don't want to talk to you on account of what you said on HBO. And I looked at him, I said, appreciate you coming. No problem, I understand. And I just walked off and I just left the gym. Because to me, that was a coward's move. You called me here for a meeting because you're interested in my play. And then you find out what I said on HBO. And you can't come to me as a man and question me about it. You just taking, just like a lot of people, you taking what they showed on TV. You don't even know the full context of what was said. Not that that would make a difference, but at least you could have had the, the courage to come to me as a man and say, hey man, this is, this is what's happening. Whether I'm getting pressure or whatever it is, this is what's going on. Or can you tell me, can you shed some light on what was said so it made me feel comfortable? Because I have problems with it. And, uh, you know, that, that's what I've been dealing with for a long time. And, uh, and, uh, and you know, it, it, it hurts, but, and it angers you. Why? Because you, you've dedicated your life to developing your skills to play this game that you love. And you do it with passion. You're competitive about it. And you want, you want a legacy just like everybody else, you know, of winning and of doing great. And all of it sort of, and I'm, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying this, I don't want nobody to feel sorry for me, but it's just a sad documentary in, when you, when, you know, in terms of how people are, you know, when, when it's just views that are expressed. And then just because of those views, you want to try to destroy somebody's career. It's constitutional to burn the flag. So <laughs> why give me a problem for not standing? It's also a, a symbol of oppression, uh, of tyranny. So it depends on how you look at it. Despite leading the Nuggets in scoring four straight years and having some unbelievably brilliant nights on the basketball floor, in one night, 1996, Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf became perhaps more famous for not standing for the national anthem. And for the first time in his career, he was no longer on the sports pages, he was on the front page. Let me tell you what happened with him. For, for months, I had been not standing. Uh, for my own personal reasons, uh, never meaning to make a public display of it. Uh, there were a few times, or a couple of times, I got caught, uh, not knowing what to do, but wanting to stick to my principles, because I'm still dealing with this issue, trying to figure out how to do it. But each time that I didn't stand, I would either stretch, act like I'm stretching, get ready for the game, or if I'm standing up, you know, I'm stretching or whatever, but I'm like looking around, not really paying attention. This was my way of, 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 I wouldn't even call it a protest. You know, I'm still trying to figure this thing out. You know what I mean? <laughs> What's going on? Uh, but knew that there was a lot of wrongs happening. And for me, if, if there's something symbolic of those wrongs, I don't feel comfortable with standing up, I don't care. Even if it's in Saudi Arabia, as Muslims we don't stand for. 
And Toddy uh, approached me in the locker room one day. He said, look, uh, there's a reporter who's been noticing that you haven't been standing. Uh, you want to get your story out? And I, t I just hung I said, well, I don't mind talking to anybody. I mean, no problem. I'll talk to him. When I talked to him, I think after that, there was a small article, a small something came out. From there, it just it exploded. I'm at practice the next day, cameras, questions. And I'm just speaking, Drew, I'm just speaking my conscience. That's all I'm doing. I'm not blowing anybody up. I'm not hurting anybody. I'm just saying what I feel. And this is something that we talk about all the time. Players talk about it on the bus, outside of the camera. People are very open, you know, but when it's time for that camera, we become shy, you know, and I'm just having a dialogue, just like you and I are having right now. And uh, that's when it all happened for me. Was it difficult for you, Mahmoud, that day in Chicago, you get suspended for, for a game, and then you come back, it's got to look like... Compromise. He, exactly. I heard it all the time. He's, he's got <laughs> principles, he's got principles, uh-oh, it's hit him in the wallet, there go the principles. You know what, man, and my response then, as it is now, was, look, you have people that are making millions of dollars to conform, to follow the rules. I, I doubt very seriously if everybody that's making millions of dollars and every time they go on their job that they agree with everything. But a lot of them feel compelled to do it. Why? Because if I don't, I'm not going to make this paycheck. So that's a form of oppression to me. Well, you can't say and do what you want to do without the fear of being victimized and losing your job. So that's my answer to that. But they never shed light on that either. I, w I had offers to go speak on television and I was contemplating that. I'm not, look, I'm not claiming to be nowhere near a scholar, but I, I have a heart and I was going to express my feelings, especially after, in light of the fact that I was being assassinated, I thought by the media, you know, putting me off as a troublemaker, you know, I got along with all, all my teammates. I mean, we didn't have the same lifestyle, but I got along with everybody. I did my job and, 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 and I had my lifestyle too. I was mad at the way I was being portrayed and I wanted to go and, and clear it, clear it up and say what I felt. I was, I got an ulcer behind that. A lot of people don't, I went to the hospital twice because holding it in inside. And I told myself that never would I do that again. That the life I live, whether it hurts me or not, and I, I'm sorry, if I'm, you know, I apologize to my wife and my kids every day for putting them through what I put them through. But I said, I made a commitment to God that before I die, I'm going to live and die with a free conscience and a free soul, whether anybody likes it or not. I never compromised my belief system. I said, in Islam, if we see something better, we do that. I went and talked to a guy that I highly respect. And he says, Mahmoud, he says, you can stand. But by standing doesn't mean that you accept everything America's doing. While you stand, you can pray for those who are dispossessed, who are struggling, who are the victims of oppression. Pray for these people. It doesn't mean you're for them. That's what caused me to come back. But I didn't want to, because I knew how it would be portrayed. Ah, oh, he's compromised. <laughs> That's the first thing I heard. And I would tell people, no, I never compromised. I just saw something better, and I did that. That's why I came back. And I never regret, and I told him that too, I never regret the decision I made. Because it was, it, was, it, was, it was what I made, it was my heart. And I still feel this way. The same statement I made, I still feel that way. I still feel that way. And it was a balanced statement, regardless of what people may say. Whether you agree or not, my thing is, I don't give my allegiance to no one but God. You know, that's, that's who I stand before, that's who I bow, for, bow before. And that's my reason. So I want you to turn when you, when you, when you stand, you're actually acting like you're getting ready to go. Don't just, don't just do this and shoot. You on me? I want you to stand, then step back. Like you really, you're trying to go to that goal. See there? Basketball ain't as simple as people think it now. Come on. I tell my sons, I say, uh, I say, now, I'm not pushing. But this is the best time, I think, to become a professional basketball player. Because the criteria is not the same anymore. I say, now they're picking pieces. They may just give a guy 10 million because he rebounds and runs the flow well. 
but he can't shoot free throw. He can't score. You know what I mean? I said, man, if you could, so that means what? Not a lot of people are really training the way they used to. Count them, though. Don't move it that way. If you're not, you're going that way. Count them out. I don't, I don't really watch uh, NBA as much. Uh, and it's not, not, not because I'm bitter. Uh, you know, I grew up, and I was fortunate enough to have played against Larry Bird, Magic, those guys, Joe Dumas. I said, man, am I, am I biased? I'm trying to check myself. I said, is the game the same? Is it better, worse? I said, because I can't really watch it as much anymore. It seems like there's a lot of entertainment. But in terms of guys being able to hit the shot on a consistent basis, knowing how to set people up, create, you know, feed off each other. I see guys over here one-on-one, -on -one, guys over here standing. You know what I mean? It's like just entertainment. Every now and then I may, I may look at some of it. And then I'm, I ended up... I end up doing something else, picking up a book or something, <laughs> you know, read, but I can't really stomach it, man, too much. Why, why a book now? I've experienced a lot, even though I'm still young. Uh, I know you only write a book like this once, uh, pretty much, unless you're just an extraordinary individual. Uh, but uh, I, just, I just feel that, you know, I have a story. Uh, hopefully that, that, that could uh, make a difference. It could touch a lot of people's lives. You know, growing up, the childhood that I had, single parent, without a father, the struggles with that, uh, then finding out you, you, you're living with a disorder that you know nothing about, you don't know what's going on with you, the struggles along with that, and how that has molded me as a human being today, shaped who I am today, not only as a basketball player, but as a person. I, I just thought it was time. And if it touches someone's life for the better, fine. I hope so. It is interesting to wonder how people will recall Mahmoud abdul Rauf. For me, I'll remember one of the most tremendously gifted, though slight, offensive basketball players I have ever seen. I'll also recall a guy that overcame tremendous odds. He grew up impoverished in Mississippi and had a very visible medical condition that was not properly diagnosed until well into his teens. And despite all of that, he reached stardom in the National Basketball Association. And I guess now he's like many of us, married and raising a family in suburbia. I hope you enjoyed this look back at Mahmoud Abdul Rauf in his own words. Till the next time. Ten seconds for the Nuggets to shoot over Norman. Switch. Incredible. Norman at six foot eight, right in the face of a fearless shooting. Chris Jackson. Jackson for the time.